Hello, this is Professor Bruce Heinrichs. In this video, I'm going to present to you some of the most important developments, inventions, and people in the development of film, movies, the cinema. For thousands of years, people have wanted to capture and retain a visual image. And one way this was done in the past is using what is called camera obscura or the dark chamber or the pinhole image, a very, very tiny hole. When, it, when an image is projected through it, it is reversed and inverted. Uh, it is theorized that uh, this inspired the Paleolithic cave paintings. The term camera obscura is used both for the device that is used sometimes with a lens uh, and was sometimes used by painters uh, to help them create their art. Uh, it also refers to the optical effect uh, that, that was used oh, ever since the 16th century. But camera obscura was not really a photograph. It was a projection of an image through a small hole. The first photograph, here it is, was made in 1826 in Burgundy, France. It's not very clear, of course, uh, but this is the first time that people were able to capture and retain a visual image. A camera can capture a still image, but what about a moving image? How can we retain and capture and retain a moving image? And there are two principles that allow this uh, to happen. One is called persistence of vision. What this means is that your brain will hold on to, will, will remember an image for a fraction of a second after the image is gone. Uh, in psychology, this is known as sensory memory. The second principle is called the phi phenomenon. And the phi phenomenon says that when there are objects or images that are close to each other, in our brain will perceive motion. This is called apparent motion. So for example, if we show people the image on the lower left of a blue circle and a red circle, and then quickly flash back and forth between the blue and the red, people will perceive the blue image moving through space and turning to red. This is called the phi phenomenon. The two principles, persistence of vision and the phi phenomenon, allow us to perceive apparent motion. That is, we perceive motion when there's none there. This was discovered hundreds of years ago and toys were created. Perhaps you've made a, a flip book yourself uh, that would allow a person to perceive motion. One of those early motion toys was called the phenakistoscope. Uh, it was invented in 1833. And it's a, just a disc with images on it that when you move it, uh, because persistence of vision means your brain will hold on to an image and then it will fuse it because of the phi phenomenon. It will fuse that that held image, that remembered image with the next image. So you get the, con the, the apparent motion perception. Another motion toy that was very popular in the 19th century was called the thaumatrope. Here's a riddle. How can you see both the head and the tail of a coin at the same time? Well, there's two answers. One answer is hold, look, hold it up to a mirror. Look at it in a mirror. You see the head and tail at the same time. But the second answer is behind the thaumatrope. Spin the coin on a table. And when it spins, it's moving so rapidly that persistence, persistence of vision allows you to hold the image of the head, but then comes the tail and diffuse them together into head, tail, head, tail. Now, this idea is the thaumatrope, where you take a disc and you put images on one side and, and, and the other, and then you tie strings to it and coil them up, wrap them up, and pull it so that it will spin. You can make yourself a thaumatrope and have fun with it. Edward Boybridge was a San Francisco photographer in the late 1800s, and he was very fascinated by a question. When a horse runs, does sometimes one foot touch the ground and the other three feet are above ground? Well, no one knew the answer to that question. So what Moybridge did is he set up a series of cameras 
with trip lines that the horse would run through and trip the lines and take successive photographs. This is called series photography. And he's able to show that yes, sometimes just one foot of the horse is on the ground. Here are some animations that were made using the uh, serial photographs that were shot by Edward Moybridge. Interesting end of Moybridge. Uh, he uh, married a young woman who then started an affair with one of his friends. And so Moybridge shot the man and killed him. He was put on trial. His lawyer pleaded insanity because he had been in an accident and injured his head. But the jury said no, uh, but we're going to acquit him because we think it's justifiable what he did. And so he was acquitted, but it kind of uh, put an end to his uh, photographic uh, experiments. A projection device invented in the uh, 1600s, but was very, very popular in the 1800s and even um, early uh, 1900s, was called the Magic Lantern. It was called magic because it was often used in shows to project demons and spirits and ghosts. And so people would flock to this, these uh, rooms where this sort of like a slide projector, this projector called the Magic Lantern, would uh, give them an interesting slideshow. A magic lantern was really like a slide projector. It had pictures on a, on a plate, usually made of glass, and then it had one or more lenses that would project it, and you had to have a light source. In fact, one of the light sources that was used was limestone, was, was uh, dumped into lit gasoline and, and became very, very hot and uh, would project what was called the limelight. And so we have that phrase, uh, he was in the limelight. It means a very, very bright light that is created by the burning of limestone. This was used in magic lanterns. So the magic lantern show was very, very popular. It was invented in the 1600s, but became common in the 1800s. And it was first used in the United States in 1743. People would go to a show, much like we go to a movie today, and it would be a slideshow using the Magic Lantern, which was a projector that had a light source and a lens. A big breakthrough in the cinema occurred in 1889 and the subsequent few years uh, because George Eastman's company developed these long uh, uh, reels of celluloid film that was able to uh, record photographic images. And Thomas Edison's company uh, developed a kinetograph, it was called, the first movie camera really, that used these long reels of celluloid film uh, to record many, many, many images that could then later be played back at a very high rate of speed and people could perceive motion. However, these first movies were not shown on a screen in front of a big audience. The one person would look into a box called a kinetoscope and turn a handle that would, would turn the film. Here you see the inside of the kinetoscope. And so this was very popular in the late 1800s. Here, for example, is a picture of the kinetoscope parlor uh, in San Francisco. And then on the right, a person who's listening to some sounds at the same time he's watching the kinetoscope pictures. The kinetoscope was, was, I guess, the first movies, but not in the way that we know them today. Today we know we go to a, a, a theater with a whole bunch of people and we watch a screen where the movies are projected. Um, this started really in Paris, France in 1895. And the first movies that were shown were almost always very short uh, documentaries of nature. These were called actualities. So who showed the first movies in the form that we see them today? And the answer is the Lumiere brothers from Lyon, France, Auguste and Louis Lumiere. They invented the device that was able to record and then project movies onto a screen and they showed the first films in Paris, France in December of 1895.
Auguste and Louis Lumiere were from Lyon, France, and you can go there today, which I did, uh, and you can see the house and museum, uh, which it is now, where you can see all of these different objects, projectors and motion toys, and also see many of the films that were made by the Lumieres in the late 19th century and early 20th century. And this is the museum in Lyon, France. Here are some pictures of it. And here are a couple more uh, photos from the Lumiere House and Museum in Lyon, France. So how did the Lumiere brothers do it? <laughs> how did they create movies as we know them today? Well, they had a machine they invented called a cinematograph. And this machine was able to record on film visual images and then project them back. And uh, in the early days, they were projected at a speed of 16 frames per second. And that was fast enough uh, for uh, the phi phenomenon to occur and people to perceive apparent motion. Uh, today or later, uh, 24 frames per second were used. The very first film that was shown the way the cinema is today was in December 1895, and the film was called Workers Leaving the Factory. It was just a film of the people who worked at the Lumiere factory. They had a photographic company in Lyon, France, and they filmed the workers leaving the factory. That was the movie in actuality. And the first masterpiece of the cinema was a Lumiere film called Arrival of a Train, in which the camera was simply set up to record at this particular angle, which is a very, very striking angle, of seeing the train come into the station, arriving in the station. This was a very important image in the history of film. Here is the first comedy movie in history, made in 1895 by Louis Lumiere. It is called The Sprinkler Sprinkle. The little boy is stepping on the hose and the guy doing the sprinkling just doesn't know what it is. And then he, then he looks at the hose. Wrong thing to do, isn't it? And the water squirts and the boy lets go of the water. The early film that most impressed audiences was this film called Rough Sea at Dover, which was made by an Englishman, Bert Acres. Uh, and when shown in 1896, it was made in 1895, first shown in 1896, audiences had never seen the motion picture and, and to see this water splashing, I mean, they were just amazed by it and people sitting in the front jumped back. They thought they were gonna get wet from the water. Another Frenchman who was very important in the development of films was named Georges Milliers. And Milliers invented the idea of fantasy films, of fiction films. You know, the Lumieres were making all these kind of documentaries, just filming nature and people. Uh, but Milliers decided to uh, make fictional films, fantasy films. And he also invented many, many special effects that were created by the camera. So here are a few images from the films of Georges Milliers. He made many, many films, and they were very fantastic uh, fictional films. And here are some more images from the films of Georges Milliers, in which you see the special effects that he used. He would make his head disappear and many heads appear and so on. Here are some more excerpts of the films of Georges Milliers, uh, who made hundreds of films in the early 1900s, these uh, films with special effects and fantastic images. Uh, unfortunately, by 1920s, he was living in poverty and not making films anymore. And then journalists started uh, to interview him and, and people started to recognize his importance in history of film. Uh, and in 1931, he was given the French uh, Legion Medal of Honor, and it was presented to him by Louis Lumiere, who called him the creator of cinematic spectacles. Uh, and in 1932, he was given a place in a retirement home by the French for him and his family. He died in 1938. 
Well, Georges Méliès made about 130 films, but his most famous film was called A Trip to the Moon in 1902. And here we see the rocket ship taking off uh, from Earth and, and approaching the moon where the astronauts will find some moon creatures. And in fact, some of the moon creatures come back to Earth with the, with the Earthlings. And in the Millier's movie, A Trip to the Moon, uh, we see a rocket ship hit the face of the moon. And that, in fact, is George Millier's face uh, in the moon. A very famous image from the history of films. One of the first films that was commercially shown in the United States is called The Kiss. It's only 18 seconds long. It was produced at the Edison Studios, which were the first film producing studios in the, in the United States. Another very early film that was made by the Edison Company and directed by uh, Porter was called The Great Train Robbery. It became an important film uh, in early uh, United States uh, film production. And here we see a, a scene in which uh, the cowboy is shooting his gun towards the camera. And then with uh, colorizing, uh, you make the uh, color effect of the explosion of the gun. In fact, the same exact effect was used by Alfred Hitchcock in a 1945 movie called Spellbound. At the end of that movie, the bad guy turns a gun and fires it and you see a red flash. So watch the movie Spellbound by Hitchcock. One of the very first movies ever made uh, is the oldest copyrighted movie also. It is called the, called the Sneeze. And as you see here, made in 1894, it's only five seconds long. D.W. Griffith, David Wark Griffith, is considered one of the most important filmmakers of early films. He pioneered uh, feature length movies that were very expensive and sometimes made a profit, but sometimes did not. He uh, also helped to create United Artists Film Studio with Charlie Chaplin, Mary Pickford, and Douglas Fairbanks, and was a founding member of the Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences. His fame was so great that he was credited with many cinematic achievements, some which were not really correct. For example, it was said that Griffith had invented the close-up, but of course this is not true, and you can see some of the earlier films, even in this video that I showed you, that involve close-ups. Anyway, D.W. Griffith was probably the first great American filmmaker. The first of uh, D.W. Griffith's films that uh, got a lot of attention was called The Birth of a Nation, uh, made in 1915. Unfortunately, this film was horribly racist and glorified the Ku Klux Klan. And so there was uh, tremendous criticism, even though it was a huge technological achievement in filmmaking. As a response to the criticisms of Birth of a Nation being such a horribly racist film, D.W. Griffith made another film in 1916 called Intolerance, in which he was uh, arguing that people should be more tolerant of his point of view. One of the amazing things about Intolerance is that it was a hugely long movie, something like three hours long. Also, it included the largest set, which I'm showing you here, uh, in the history of film and probably will never be uh, topped because now people don't need to make big sets. You can, you can simply use computer to create a big set, but this was a gigantic set, as you can tell. But look at how tiny the people are. And then one more thing about intolerance. Uh, it presented four different stories that were intercut, jumping from one story to the other. Now, this is sometimes called thematic montage. Uh, what, what people didn't know is whether an audience would be able to follow all the stories because it jumped back and forth from one story to another. But in fact, it was easy to follow. And this is 
uh, still done today. Today we still see this kind of thematic montage in films where you can jump around and the audience can still follow it. Uh, uh, so there were four stories all about intolerance, people being intolerant to others uh, in this very famous movie. Of course, in the early days of filmmaking, films weren't just coming out of America. They were coming from other countries. And for example, in 1914, there was this huge film called Cabiria, which came from Italy. And it influenced many, many other films, including D.W. Griffith's film Intolerance was, was influenced by Cabiria. Here I'm showing you um, a still of uh, one of the giant sets in Cabiria, which involves the god Moloch. Uh, and this film shows the sacrifice of humans, human sacrifice to the god of Moloch. But this was a very important film in the early filmmaking and influenced many other films. In 1922, we had a film called Nanook of the North, which was made by Robert Flaherty in uh, Canada. Uh, and this is often considered the first documentary film. It's a very interesting film to watch, and it's very controversial because uh, it is all staged. Uh, Flaherty discovered that when he took films of the Inuit people and showed them in New York, no one cared, and that he had to create a story for people to care about. And so he had the Inuit people wear costumes that they didn't normally wear and go hunting and do do activities that they didn't normally do but he wanted to create a story and this this became what is considered the first documentary so what we think of as a documentary a lot of people think a documentary means a film that is shot uh, that is completely true but that is not correct documentary is more like an essay it's a point of view uh it it often has elements that are not true or out of order or out of context in order to make a point of view. Uh, nonfiction films are quite interesting because you can have all the way from something like a candid camera, which still involves editing, uh, to um, direct what is called direct cinema or cinema verite, uh, which just points the camera at people or events and shows what's happening, but then still involves uh, editing. So it's not completely true. It's impossible to completely have a film that's totally true. Uh, the documentary is the least true of all the nonfiction films. As I mentioned, in the early days of film, films were being made all around the world, not just in the United States. And in fact, one of the biggest filmmaking uh, studios was in Germany. And the films coming out of there in the late 19 teens and early 1920s and even later 1920s were called German Expressionist films. They had this very expressionist, artistic look, style to them, and they're very fun films to go back and look at. At about the same time that German Expressionist films were developing uh, in the uh, late 19 teens and early 1920s in the United States, uh, many, many filmmakers were turning to comedy and there were uh, many uh, comedian stars of film. Uh, here I'm showing three of them, uh, Charlie Chaplin, Harold Lloyd, and Buster Keaton, three very great, uh, very fun uh, stars of many films that came out of early Hollywood. And you would be uh, well off to go watch some of these silent films. Uh, silent films continued until, oh, roughly about 1927, when synchronized sound started coming into movies. And then by 1929, uh, films after were, were very, very rarely were silent films after 1929. One of the greatest of the early filmmakers from Russia was Sergei Eisenstein, who was not only a great filmmaker, but he was a film theorist. He wrote books and articles about film and he especially was interested in what is called montage, a French term that means assembly or editing, the way that pieces of the film are put together to create meaning. And so Eisenstein was very interested in montage. Montage, he said, it was the nerve of cinema. And to determine the nature of montage was to solve the specific problem of cinema, meaning that to 
convey meaning uh, in films uh, was mostly dependent on montage. So we consider Sergei Eisenstein to be the first great film editor and the first great film theorist in history. Eisenstein made many, many great films, but his most important film and one of the most studied films in history of cinema is called Battleship Potemkin, which came out in 1925, and it included uh, a sequence known as the Odessa Step Sequence, in which the Tsar soldiers kill the people of Odessa who are uh, congregated on the steps. And this scene is amazing for the montage sequences uh, that are shown. And, and he even used acrobats with cameras around, around their waist, doing tumbling down the side, uh, recording images. So you should really watch Battleship Potemkin for many, many years. Uh, it was considered the greatest and most influential film ever made until, of course, 1941. Citizen Kane by Orson Welles came out and, and used uh, such amazing new techniques like deep focus of the camera that it uh, surged ahead of uh, Battleship Potemkin uh, in, uh, in its influence. In the early development of the cinema, an important voice came from Ukrainian Soviet person uh, who was born uh, David Kaufman, but went by the name Dennis Kaufman until in the 1920s when he started making newsreels and developed this theory called Kino Pravda, film truth. And the idea was that the camera can go anywhere and record everything. And the most important job of cinema was to document events and people around the world. And so, Dennis Kaufman changed his name to Ziga Vertov, which literally means Wurr Spinning Top. Yeah, his name was Wurr Spinning Top, Ziga Vertov. He had two younger brothers who were cinematographers. Boris Kaufman went off to Hollywood and became director of photography for some important films, including On the Waterfront, and 12 Angry Men and others. And his younger brother, Mikhail Kaufman, was the cinematographer for this very famous movie called Man with a Movie Camera, which came out in 1929, directed by Ziga Vertov, and it exemplified his ideas about what uh, the cinema should do. It should be film truth, Kino Pravda, document the world. Here are some more uh, just amazing images from Ziga Vertov's 1929 film, Man with a Movie Camera, which is also called Kino Eye. It's the type of documentary filmmaking which tries to put the camera everywhere to record everything. But notice Ziga Vertov also loved special effects. He loved to do uh, different things with the camera that would show these special effects uh, that we love so much. Even in the very early days of uh, filmmaking in the late 1800s, early 1900s, uh, filmmakers were playing around with the use of sound, but they were not able to synchronize the sound to the visual images. The first film that had uh, some kind of sound mechanism was Dream Street. It was originally a short film by D.W. Griffith, and later made into a feature length film but it did not have complete synchronization of sound. Also the film Don Juan, which came out in the 1926, uh, Dream Street was 1921. Uh, Don Juan in 1926 had synchronized sound for the music, but no dialogue. The film that is uh, considered the first of the talking film, the talkies, uh, era is the 1927 film, The Jazz Singer with Al Jolson. The whole film is not synchronized sound, but some parts of it are including some dialogue, including quite famous dialogue by Al Jolson, in which he says, 
you ain't heard nothing yet. And that's correct. You ain't heard nothing yet, 1927. And then the first all talking uh, picture came out, Lights of New York in 1928. Uh, after 1929, uh, silent films were pretty much done. Uh, I think uh, Chaplin did make one silent film after 1929, but pretty much everything was sound uh, film after that, what were called talkies. Okay, I hope you enjoyed this excursion into the early development of the cinema. And be sure to uh, subscribe to my channel and look at my other videos. Bye.